you take them apart, they don't mean the same thing. You can talk about yellow journalism, but if you say blue journalism, it's not the same thing. Now, if you don't know any of these, that's, don't worry about it. If you, particularly the ones on the left, which are all from the United States, if they don't mean anything to you, that's fine and you're not alone. Because there are many, many Americans that they don't mean a lot to either. But if these things appear in books or in the newspaper in the United States, there's no little, you know, note that says, see, you know, that will tell you what it means. You're expected to know these because they're part of the culture. So the big three is, is the, it started with the, the big three car corporations, which I think are Ford, Chrysler, and I think it was I don't know. Anyhow, it was the, see, I don't know. It's the three top car manufacturers, and so they called them the big three. And big stick diplomacy was Teddy Roosevelt said that the way to deal with diplomacy is that you, you know, you carry a big stick. You, you have a threat behind you. And yellow journalism started actually in California, and it was the idea of Hearst, a famous journalist, um, who said that if you want to sell papers, you just tell good, sensational stories, and that'll be yellow journalism. So you tell about who's seen who and what the latest love affair is, and you've got good journalism. And Uncle Tom came from a novel where it was uh, a, one of the um, slave, slaves who very much wanted to please the white master, and he was called an Uncle Tom. All right, so these are aspects of English that are embedded, you know, no, as, the, as part of the culture is embedded in English. But if you're teaching English, and it's an international language, do you need to teach your students any of these? Well, I would argue, of course not. Because if you're in Korea, these are phrases that deal with American culture. Why do you need to teach that? Unless your students or you are interested in it, that's fine. But not something that you need to know to know English. The other ones are perhaps more widely used, that if you were in in England, or if you were in Australia, or in the United States, you might know things like the pound of flesh and Good Samaritan. But um, they are nonetheless all related to Western culture. So you might say, well, why does English have to be something connected to Western culture? Isn't it a global language, and it's just as much part of the East as the West? So why do we have to learn about you know, things that would be Good Samaritan that would come out of a different tradition than the East. So it's, it's something to think about. Does that even belong in our English as an international set of, of vocabulary that we need to know? Now, the pragmatic level is one of the most important for being able to use English for intercultural communication for being able to tell each other about your, um, your culture and your needs. And pragmatics um, has to do with what's appropriate. Now I got this from a textbook, and maybe you use something like this in your English classroom, where it's teaching people to be polite. And so it asks the students, when someone compliments the watch you are wearing, you would first say, oh, this cheap thing, Give it to them, say thanks and smile, or say, would you like to have it? All right, now it's set up like a multiple choice. It's like a test item. So which item, which one is the right answer? All four. All right, first of all, I think in any, I mean, I think any of you might think of circumstances, or we all could think of circumstances where we might use one of these. But there would be ones that would be, tend to be more common in a certain culture than others. So, for example, in many Asian countries, something like one might be more, well, research shows it's more typical. So that if someone says, my, that was a wonderful meal you cooked, very common response would be, oh, no, 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 no. I, it could have been better. All right? So you're downplaying. You're saying, oh, no, I mean, I'm not modest. I'm, I, how can I say, oh, that was a wonderful. 
Tony on. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I really worked hard. And I mean, they would think, well, what, what is this person that they are? They think they're pretty good. So this downplaying is very common. Um, and I mean, so then the question is, if that's what you feel comfortable saying when someone gives you a compliment, then is, does the fact that you're using English mean that you have to change? In fact, number three would probably be more common in many so-called inner circle countries. Probably in the United States, if someone said, many people would say, that was a good meal, and the other person would say, thanks. But just because that's what's more common there, why, do you have, why would you have to do that if that's not what you feel comfortable doing? So then, the, then, but the fact is, is that it may lead to a feeling of probably annoyance. That if you expect, for example, if, if many Indian speakers of English, when you compliment them, say nothing, then if you expect someone to say something when you compliment them, you're going to feel a little annoyed. So it, it may be that that's going to create some misunderstanding. So you, you, then you would say, well, maybe then if it's going to create misunderstandings, we better just all do what, what the inner circle does. But no, that, that's, that's not right, because it isn't a language of the inner circle anymore. So what we've got to do is both sides have to realize that, yeah, we're, learning Eng we're, we're using English, but we're using it by different cultural standards. And so we're just going to have to recognize that there's differences. And one thing that can be done in English classes is to have dialogues, to have role playing, where people do show that when someone compliments someone else, there's many ways you can respond. And you may feel one's more appropriate, but another person may have a different set of values, often cultural values. So we've got to be a lot more, it's gonna be, it's, it's gonna be harder to teach this kind of culture than to just say, our target is whatever they're doing in inner circle countries. That's relatively easy, but it's not good for people learning English who have to change the way they behave just because they're speaking English. Now, the other thing is what I said was discourse. So that's how you um, write things. Now, I, I'm not sure if it's the same in Korea, but when I um, was working in Japan, I remember quite several times getting a business letter, something asking me to do something, and it would start out by saying, oh, the weather, or the, the cherry blossoms are in bloom, <laughs> spring has begun, and then they would say um, whatever they were going to say. Is that done? Is that typical? Okay. All right. So you're writing a business letter. You're using English. So how do you start your letter? You know, you live in Korea, you live in Japan, you're starting a business letter, what do you do? Well, in what is basically done in a lot of classrooms is you do with the target language, what the inner circle does. So if the inner circle says right away, they don't talk about the weather, they just say, Dear sir, I'm writing to you to complain about what I received in the mail. And they would start out by saying, the cherry blossoms are there, I'm writing to you to complain about what I got in the mail. They just do that. So, whose standards do you use? Well, it would seem to be that, yeah, it's time for us to change. Why do we have to do what the inner circle does if it's an international language? Maybe it's time for everyone to learn there's different ways to organize a business letter. And because it's in English, good, you can understand what's said. And how it's said is going to differ a great deal. And you're, everyone's going to have to do a little bit more of trying to understand the culture of the person who's using the language. So that makes a big difference about what we, how we teach writing. Now I do want to make one aside here that I know some of you may be teaching students who will be going to study in, in like the United States or Great Britain. And so what you may say is, well, when they get there, they're going to have to write business letters the way they do in Great Britain or the United States. And that's, that's probably true, that if they're going to write effective business letters when they are within the United States, probably they'll have to learn that that's what you do when you're there. So like when, you know,